The preface by A.W. Pink to the attributes of God. Acquaint now thyself with him, and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. Job 22.21 Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man grow in his wisdom, neither let the mighty glory in his might, let not the rich glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 The spiritual and saving knowledge of God is the greatest need of every human creature. The foundation of all true knowledge of God must be a clear mental apprehension of his perfections as revealed in, the whole, in Holy Scripture. An unknown God can neither be trusted, served, nor worshipped. In this book, an effort has been made to set forth some of the principal perfections of the divine character. If the reader is to truly profit from his perusal of the pages that follow, he needs to definitely and earnestly beseech God to bless them to him, to apply his truth to the conscience and heart so that his life will be transformed thereby. Something more than a theoretical knowledge of God is needed by us. God is only truly known in the soul as we yield ourselves to him, submit to his authority, and regulate all the details of our lives by his holy precepts and commandments. Then shall we know if we follow on in the path of obedience to know the Lord. Hosea 6.3 If any man will do his will, he shall know. John 7.17 the people that do know their God shall be strong. Daniel 11.32 Arthur W. Pink Chapter 1 The Solitariness of God The title of this article is perhaps not sufficiently explicit to indicate its theme. This is partly due to the fact that so few today are accustomed to meditate upon the personal perfections of God. Comparatively few of those who occasionally read the Bible are aware of the awe-inspiring and worship-provoking grandeur of the divine character, that God is great in wisdom, wondrous in power, yet full of mercy, is assumed by many to be almost common knowledge. But to entertain anything approaching an adequate con conception of his being, his nature, his attributes, as these are revealed in Holy Scripture, is something which very, very few people in these degenerate times have attained unto. God is solitary in his excellency. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Exodus 15.11 in, in the beginning, God, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, there was a time, if time it could be called, when God, in the unity of his nature, those subsisting equally in three divine persons, dwelt all alone. In the beginning, God. There was no heaven where his glory is now particularly manifested. There was no earth to engage his attention. There were no angels to hymn his praises, no universe to be upheld by the word of his power. There was nothing, no one but God and that not for a day, a year, or an age, but from everlasting. During a past eternity, God was alone, self-contained, self-sufficient, self-satisfied, in need of nothing. Had a universe, had angels, had human beings been necessary to him in any way, they also had been called into existence from all eternity. The creating of them, when he did, added nothing to God essentially. He changes not, Malachi 3.6. Therefore, his essential glory can be neither augmented nor diminished. God was under no constraint, no obligation, no necessity to create. That he chose to do so was, so, was purely a sovereign act on his part, caused by nothing outside himself, determined by nothing but his own mere good pleasure, for he worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, Ephesians 1.11. That he did create was simply for his manifest state of glory. Do some of our readers imagine that we have gone beyond what scripture warrants? Then our appeal shall be to the law and to the testimony. 
Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Nehemiah 9.5 God is no gainer even from our worship. He was in no need of that external glory of his grace which arises from his redeemed, for he is glorious enough in himself without that. What was it that moved him to predestinate his elect to the praise of the glory of his grace? It was, as Ephesians 5 te- uh, 1, five tells us, according to the good pleasure of his will. We are well aware that the high ground we are here treading is new and strange to almost all of our readers. For that reason, it is well to move slowly. Let our appeal again be to the Scriptures. At the end of Romans 11, where the Apostle brings to a close his long argument on salvation by pure and sovereign grace, he asks, For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed to him again? Verses 34 and 35. The force of this is, it is impossible to bring the Almighty under obligations to the creature. God gains nothing from us. If thou be righteous, what giveth thou him? Or what receiveth he of thine hand? Thy wickedness may hurt a man as thou art, and thy righteousness may profit the son of man. Job 35, 7 and 8. But is it is certainly cannot but it certainly cannot affect God who is all blessed in himself. When ye shall have done all that all those things which are commanded you say, We are unprofitable servants, Luke seventeen ten. Our obedience has profited God nothing. Nay, we go further. Our Lord Jesus Christ added nothing to God in his essential being and glory, either by what he did or suffered. True, blessedly and gloriously true, he manifested the glory of God to us, but he added nothing to God. He himself expressly declares so, and there is no appeal from his words. My goodness extendeth not to thee, Psalm 16.2. The whole of that psalm is a psalm of Christ. Christ's goodness or righteousness reached unto his saints in the earth, Psalm 16.3. But God was high above and beyond it all. God only is the Blessed One, Mark 14.61 in the Greek. It is perfectly true that God is both honored and dishonored by men, not in his essential being, but in his official character. It is equally true that God has been glorified by creation, by providence, and by redemption. This we do not and dare not dispute for a moment. But all of this has to do with his manifested glory and the recognition of it by us. Yet had God so pleased, he might have continued alone for all eternity without making known his glory unto creatures. Whether he should do so or not was determined solely by his own will. He was perfectly blessed in himself before the first creature was called into being. And what are all the creatures excuse me, what and what are all the creatures of his hand unto him even now? Let scripture again make answer. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. To whom then will ye liken God, or what likeness will you compare unto him? Isaiah 40, verses 15 to 18. That is the God of Scripture. Alas, he is still the unknown God, Acts 17.23, to the heedless multitudes. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in, that bringeth the princes to nothing, he maketh the judges of the earth as vanity, Isaiah 40, 22, and 23. How vastly different is the God of Scripture from the 
God, little g, o, d, of the average pulpit. Nor is the testimony of the New Testament any different from that of the Old. How could it be, seeing that both have one and the same author? There, too, we read, which in his times he shall know, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. 1 Timothy 6.16 Such a one is to be revered, worshipped, and adored. He is solitary in his majesty, unique in his excellency, peerless in his perfections. He sustains all, but is himself independent of all. He gives to all, but is enriched by none. Such a God cannot be found out by searching. He can be known only as he is revealed to the heart of the, by the Holy Spirit through the Word. It is true that creation demonstrates a creator so plainly that men are without excuse. Yet we still have to say with Job, Lo, these are parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him. But the thunder of his power who can understand? Job 26.14 the so-called argument from design by well-meaning, quote, apologists, end quote, has, we believe, done more, much more harm than good, for it has attempted to bring down the great God to the level of a finite comprehension, and thereby has lost sight of his solitary excellence. Analogy has been drawn between a savage finding a watch upon the sands, and from a close examination of it he infers a watchmaker. So far, so good. But attempt to go further. Suppose the savage sits down on the sand and endeavors to form to himself a conception of this watchmaker, his personal affections and manners, his disposition, acquirements, and moral character, all that goes to make up a personality. Could he ever think or reason out a real man, the man who made the watch, so that he could say, I am acquainted with him? It seems trifling to ask such questions, but is the eternal and infinite God so much more within the grasp of human reason? No, indeed. The God of Scripture can only be known by those to whom He makes Himself known. Nor is God known by the intellect. God is spirit, John 4.24, and therefore can only be known spiritually. But fallen man is not spiritual, he is carnal, he is dead to all that is spiritual. Unless he is born again, supernaturally brought from death unto life, miraculously translated out of darkness into light, he cannot see the things of God, John 3.3. 3. Still less apprehend them, 1 Corinthians 2.14. The Holy Spirit has to shine in our hearts, not intellects, in order to give us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. And even that spiritual knowledge is but fragmentary. The regenerated soul has to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, 2 Peter 3, 18. The principal prayer and aim of Christians should be that we walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Colossians 1.10 Chapter 2 The Decrees of God The decree of God is His purpose or determination with respect to future things. We have used the singular number as Scripture does, Romans 8.28 and Ephesians 3.11, because there was only one act of His infinite mind about future things, but we speak as if there had been many because our minds are only capable of thinking of successive revolutions as thoughts and occasions arise or in reference to the various objects of his decree, which being many seem to us to require a distinct purpose for each one. But an infinite understanding does not proceed by steps but from one stage to another. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. world. Acts 
The scriptures make mention of the decrees of God in many passages and under a variety of terms. The word decree is found in Psalm 2, 7, etc. In Ephesians 3:11, we read of his eternal purpose. In Acts 2:23, of his determinate counsel and foreknowledge. In Ephesians 1:9, of the mystery of his will. In Romans 8:29, that he also did predestinate. In Ephesians 1, of his good pleasure, God's decrees are called his counsel to signify that they are consummately wise. They are called God's will to show that he was under no control but acted according to his own pleasure. When a man's will is the rule of his conduct, it is usually capricious and unreasonable, but wisdom is always associated with will in the divine proceedings and accordingly, God's decrees are said to be the counsel of his own will. Ephesians 1.11 The decrees of God relate to all future things without exception. Whatever is done in time was foreordained before time began. God's purpose was concerned with everything, whether great or small, whether good or evil, although with reference to the latter, we must be careful to state that while God is the orderer and controller of sin, he is not the author of it in the same way that he is the author of good. Sin could not proceed from a holy God by positive and direct creation, but only by a decretive permission and negative action. God's decree is as comprehensive as his government, extending to all creatures and all events, it was concerned about our life and death, about our state in time, and our state in eternity. As God works all things after the counsel of his own will, we learn from his works what his counsel is or was, as we judge of an architect's plans by inspecting the building which was erected under his directions. God did not merely decree to make man, place him under the earth, and then leave him to his own uncontrolled guidance. Instead, he fixed all the circumstances in the lot of individuals and all the particulars which will comprise the history of the human race from its commencement to its close. He did not merely decree that general laws should be established for the government of the world, but he settled the application of those laws to all particular cases. Our days are numbered, and so are the hairs of our heads. We may learn what is the extent of the dec divine decrees from the dispensations of providence in which they are executed. The care of providence reaches to the most insignificant creatures and the most minute events, the death of a sparrow and the fall of a hare. Let us now consider some of the properties of the divine decrees. First, they are eternal. To suppose any of them to be made in time is to suppose that some new occasion had occurred, some unforeseen event or combination of circumstances had arisen, which had induced the Most High to form a new resolution. This would argue that the knowledge of the Deity is limited and that He is growing wiser in the progress of time, which would be a horrible blasphemy. No man who believes that the divine understanding is infinite, comprehending the past, the present, and the future, will ever assent to the erroneous doctrine of temporal decrees. God is not ignorant of future events which will be executed by human volitions. He has foretold them in innumerable instances, and prophecy is but the manifestation of his eternal prescience. Scripture affirms that believers were chosen in Christ before the world began, Ephesians 1.4. Yea, that grace was given to them then, 2 Timothy 1.9. Secondly, the decrees of God are wise. Wisdom is shown in the selection of the best possible ends and of the fittest means of accomplishing them. That this character belongs to the decrees of God is evident from what we know of them. They are disclosed to us by their execution, and every proof of wisdom in the works of God is a proof of the wisdom of the plan in conformity to which they are performed. As the psalmist declared, O Lord, how manifest are thy works! 
in wisdom thou hast made them all psalm 104:24 it is indeed but a very small part of them which falls under our observation yet we ought to proceed here as we do in other cases and judge of the whole by the specimen of what is unknown by what is known he who perceives the workings of admirable skill in the parts of a machine which he has an opportunity opportunity to examine is naturally led to believe that the other parts are equally admirable in like manner we should satisfy our minds as to god's works when doubts obtrude themselves upon us and repel any objections that may be suggested by something that we cannot reconcile to our notions of what is good and wise when we reach the bounds of the finite and gaze towards the mysterious realm of the infinite let us exclaim o oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and of the knowledge of god romans 11:33 thirdly they are free who hath directed the spirit of the lord or being his counselor hath taught him with whom took he counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding isaiah 40 verses 13 and 14 god was alone when he made his decrees and his determinations were influenced by no external cause he was free to decree or not to decree and to decree one thing and not another this liberty we must ascribe to him who is supreme independent and sovereign in all his doings fourthly they are absolute and unconditional the execution of them is not suspended upon any condition which may or may not be performed in every instance where god has decreed an end he has also decreed every mean to that end the one who decreed the salvation of his elect also decreed to work faith in them second thessalonians 2:13 my counsel shall stand and i will do all my pleasure isaiah 46:10 but that could not be if his counsel depended upon a condition which might not be performed but god worketh all things after the counsel of his own will ephesians 1:11 side by side with the immutability immutability and invincibility of god's decree scripture plainly teaches that man is a responsible creature and answerable for his actions and if our thoughts are formed from god's word the maintenance of the one will not lead to the denial of the other that there is a real difficulty in defining where the one ends and the other begins is freely granted this is ever the case where there is a conjunction of the divine and the human real prayer is indicted by the spirit yet it is also the cry of a human heart the scriptures are the inspired word of god yet they were written by men who were something more than machines in the hand of the spirit christ is both god and man he is omniscient yet increased in wisdom luke 252 he was almighty yet was crucified through weakness second corinthians 13:4 he was the prince of life yet he died high mysteries are these yet faith receives them unquestionably it has often been pointed out in the past that every objection made against the eternal decrees of god applies with equal force against his eternal foreknowledge whether god has decreed all things that ever come to pass or not This is a quote by the way from Jonathan Edwards quote whether god has decreed all things that ever come to pass or not all things beforehand now it is self evident that if he knows all things beforehand he either doth approve of them or doth not approve of them that is he either is willing they should be or he is not willing that they should be but to will that they should be is to decree them in quote finally attempt with me to assume and then to contemplate the opposite to deny the divine decrees would be to predicate a world and all its concerns regulated by undesigned chance or blind fate then what peace what assurance what comfort would there be for our poor hearts and minds 
What refuge would there be to fly to in the hour of need and trial? None at all. There would be nothing better than the black darkness and abject horror of atheism. O oh, my reader, how thankful should we be that everything is determined by infinite wisdom and goodness. What praise and gratitude are due unto God for His divine decrees. It is because of them that we know that, we, that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Romans 8.28 Well, may we exclaim, For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Romans 11.36 Chapter 3 The Knowledge of God God is omniscient. He knows everything, everything possible, everything actual, all events and all creatures of the past, the present, and the future. He is perfectly acquainted with every detail in the life of every being in heaven, in earth, and in hell. He knoweth what is in the darkness. Daniel 2.22 Nothing escapes his notice. Nothing can be hidden from him. Nothing is forgotten by him. Well may we say with the psalmist, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. Psalm 139.6 His knowledge is perfect. He never errs, never changes, never overlooks anything. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4.13 Yes, such is the God with whom we have to do. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassed my path and my lying downs, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Psalm 139, verses 2-4. to four. What a wondrous being is the God of Scripture. Each of his glorious attributes should render him honorable in our esteem. The apprehension of his omniscience ought to bow us in adoration before him. Yet how little do we meditate upon this divine perfection? It is because the very thought of it fills us with uneasiness. How solemn is this fact? Nothing can be concealed from God. For I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. Ezekiel 11.5 Though he is invisible to us, we are not so to him. Neither the darkness of night, the, closet, the closest curtains, nor the deepest dungeon can hide any sinner from the eyes of omniscience. The trees of the garden were not able to conceal our first parents. No human eye beheld Cain murder his brother, but his maker witnessed his crime. Sarah might laugh derisively in the seclusion of her tent, yet was it heard by Jehovah? Achan stole a wedge of gold and carefully hid it in the earth, but God brought it to light. David was at much pains to cover up his wickedness, but ere long the all-seeing God sent one of his servants to say to him, Thou art the man. And to writer and reader it is also said, Be sure your sin will find you out. Numbers 32.23 Men would strip deity of his omniscience if they could. What a proof that the carnal mind is enmity against God. Romans 8.7 the wicked do as naturally hate this divine perfection as much as they are naturally compelled to acknowledge it. They wish there might be no witness of their sins, no searcher of their hearts, no judge of their deeds. They seek to banish such a God from their thoughts. They consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Hosea 7.2 How solemn is Psalm 90 verse 8. Good reason has every Christ rejecter for trembling before it. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. But to the believer, the fact of God's omniscience is a truth fraught with much comfort. In times of perplexity, he says with Job, But he knoweth the way that I take. Job 23.10 
It may be profoundly mysterious to me, quite incomprehensible to my friends, but he knoweth. In times of weariness and weakness, believers assure themselves, he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. Psalm 103, verse 14. In times of doubt and suspicion, they appeal to this very attribute, saying, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. In time of sad failure, when our actions have belied our hearts, when our deeds have repudiated our devotion, and the searching question comes to us, Lovest thou me? We say as Peter did, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. John 21.17 Here is encouragement to prayer. There is no cause for fearing that the petitions of the righteous will not be heard, or that their sighs and tears shall escape the notice of God, since he knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. There is no danger of the individual saint being overlooked amidst the multitude of supplicants who daily and hourly present their various petitions for an infinite mind is as capable of paying the same attention to millions as if only one individual were seeking its attention. So, too, the lack of appropriate language, the inability to give expressions to the deepest longings of the soul, will not jeopardize our prayers, for it shall come to pass that before they call I will answer, and while they are yet speaking I will hear. Isaiah 65:24. Great is our Lord, and of great power. His understanding is infinite. Psalm 147.5 God not only knows whatsoever has happened in the past in every part of his vast domain, and he is not only thoroughly acquainted with everything that is now transpiring throughout the entire universe, but he is also perfectly cognizant of every event from the least to the greatest that ever will happen in the age, ages to come. God's knowledge of the future is as complete as his knowledge of the past and the present, and that because the future depends entirely upon himself. Were it in any wise possible for something to occur apart from either the direct agency or permission of God, then that something would be independent of him and he would at once cease to be supreme. Now, the divine knowledge of the future is not a mere abstraction, but something which is inseparably connected with and accompanied by his purpose. God has himself designed whatsoever shall be, and what he has designed must be effectuated. As his most sure word affirms, he doth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand. Daniel 4.35 And again, there are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Proverbs 19.21 The wisdom and power of God being alike infinite, the accomplishment of whatever he hath purposed is absolutely guaranteed. It is no more possible for the divine counsels to fail in their execution than it would be for the thrice holy God to lie. Nothing relating to the future is anywise uncertain so far as the actualization of God's counsels are concerned. None of his decrees are left contingent either on creatures or secondary causes. There is no future event which only a mere possibility, which is only a mere possibility. There is something which may or may not come to pass. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning. Acts 15.18 Whatever God has decreed is inexorably certain, for he is without variableness or shadow of turning. James 1.17 Therefore we are told at the very beginning of that book, which unveils to us so much of the future of the things which must shortly come to pass. Revelation 1.1 1, 1. The perfect knowledge of God is exemplified and illustrated in every prophecy recorded in his word. In the Old Testament are to be found scores of predictions concerning the history of Israel, 
which were fulfilled to their minutest detail centuries after they were made. In them, too, are scores more foretelling the earthly career of Christ, and they, too, were accomplished literally and perfectly. Such prophecies could only have been given by one who knew the end from the beginning and whose knowledge rested upon the unconditional certainty of the accomplishment of everything foretold. In like manner, both Old and New Testament contain many other announcements yet future, and they too must be fulfilled, Luke twenty four forty four, must be foretold by him who decreed them. It should, however, be pointed out that neither God's knowledge nor his cognition of the future, considered simply in themselves, are causative. Nothing has ever come to pass or ever will merely because God knew it. The cause of all things is the will of God. The man who really believes the scripture Scriptures know beforehand that the seasons will continue to follow each other with unfailing regularity to the end of the earth's history, Genesis 8.22, yet his knowledge is not the cause of their succession. So God's knowledge does not arise from things because they are or will be, but because he has ordained them to be. God knew and foretold the crucifixion of his son many hundreds of years before he became incarnate, and this because in the divine purpose he was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Hence we read of his being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Acts 2.23 A word or two by way of application. The infinite knowledge of God should fill us with amazement. How far exalted above the wisest man is the Lord. None of us knows what a day may bring forth, but all futurity is open to his omniscient gaze. The infinite knowledge of God ought to fill us with holy awe. Nothing we do, say, or even think escapes the cognizance of him with whom we have to do. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Proverbs 15.3 what a curb this would be unto us did we but meditate upon it more frequently. Instead of acting recklessly, we should say with Hagar, Thou, God, seest me. Genesis 16:13. The apprehension of God's infinite knowledge should fill the Christian with adoration. The whole of my life stood open to his view from the beginning. He foresaw my every fall, my every sin, my every backsliding, yet nevertheless fixed his heart upon me. Oh, how the realization of this should bow me in wonder and worship before him. Chapter 4 The Foreknowledge of God What controversies have been engendered by this subject in the past? But what truth of Holy Scripture is there which has not been made the occasion of theological and ecclesiastical battles? The deity of Christ, his virgin birth, his atoning death, his second advent, the believer's justification, sanctification, surety, security, the church, its organization, officers, discipline, baptism, the Lord's Supper, and a score of other precious truths might be mentioned. Yet the controversies which have been waged over them did not close the mouths of God's faithful servants. Why then should we avoid the vexed questions of God's foreknowledge? Because, forsooth, there are some who will charge us with fomenting strife. Let others contend if they will. Our duty is to bear witness according to the light vouchsafed vouch us. There are two things concerning the foreknowledge of God about which many are in ignorance. The meaning of the term, its scriptural scope. Because this ignorance is so widespread, it is an easy matter for preachers and teachers to palm off perversions of this subject, even upon the people of God. There is only one safeguard against error, and that is to be established in the faith. And for that, there has to be prayerful and diligent study and a receiving with meekness the engrafted word of God. Only then are we fortified against the attacks of those who assail us. There are those today who are misusing this very truth in order to discredit and, de and deny the absolute sovereignty of God in the salvation of sinners. 
just as higher critics are repudiating the divine inspiration of the scriptures, evolutionists, the work of God and creation, so some pseudo Bible teachers are perverting his foreknowledge in order to set aside his unconditional election unto eternal life. When the solemn and blessed subject of divine foreordination is expounded, when God's eternal choice of certain ones to be conformed to the image of his Son is set forth, the enemy sends along some man to argue that election is based upon the foreknowledge of God, and this foreknowledge is interpreted to mean that God foresaw certain ones would be more pliable than others, that they would respond more readily to the strivings of the Spirit, and that because God knew that would they would believe, he accordingly predestinated them unto salvation. But such a statement is radically wrong. It repudiates the truth of total depravity, for it argues there is something good in some men. It takes away the independency of God, for it makes his decrees rest upon what he discovers in the creature. It completely turns things upside down, for in saying God foresaw certain sinners would believe in Christ, and that because of this he predestinated them unto salvation is the very reverse of the truth. Scripture affirms that God in his high sovereignty singled out certain ones to be recipients of his distinguishing favors, Acts 13.48, and therefore he determined to bestow unto them the gift of faith. False theology makes God's foreknowledge of our believing the cause of his election to salvation, whereas God's election is the cause and our believing in Christ is the effect.